Let's give a warm welcome to Lord Brown, the former CEO of BP, the chairman of L1 Energy in Europe, and someone who talked about the transition when it wasn't cool. That was back in 1997. Let's give him a warm welcome to the World Energy Council. Just so we know the format, this is a 30-minute discussion. I want to allow 10 minutes for questions. We'll have some uh, roaming microphones at the end. Uh, I'm not sure if I should be that generous, because I could talk to you probably for an hour, knowing the discussion we had uh, in the green room. Uh, the seminal speech that you made uh, talking about the transition and the role of hydrocarbons in climate change was in 1997. And I remember a quote uh, after reading that speech as saying that many thought you left the church as a CEO of a hydrocarbon producer, which has changed its look today. Uh, why did you think back at, in that period of time as a CEO of one of the oil majors of the world, oil and gas majors of the world, it was important to mark the moment and to try to change the mentality? And did you have the impact you were hoping to have in so retrospect? So good morning. Uh, uh, it was very clear. In 97, there was enough uh, information, enough facts, enough analysis to say carbon dioxide was changing the way the climate would work, uh, and we were producing, either directly or indirectly with our products, a lot of carbon dioxide and methane, uh, which was just as damaging. So we had to reduce that. So we couldn't detect, determine what the world would do. So our first approach was to say, this is what we're going to do as a company. We had a very specific set of actions, an action plan, rather than just wringing our hands and saying, it's a terrible situation, what do we do next? So, so we did that, uh, and we hoped that others would follow. Uh, there were one or two people who said, yes, we're going to do something. But the vast bulk of people said, why don't we kick this can down the road and wait and see? Uh, and I think that's really what happened for the next 20 years or so. Uh, people saying it's too big of a problem, uh, it's something that will happen uh, beyond my lifetime as a CEO, and so why should I do anything about it? Hmm. How alarmed are you, candidly, uh, Lord Brown, about the uh, climate change that we see today, the 2% target, and the sense of urgency that's required. I thought something has changed here at the World Energy Congress. I've covered the last two in South Korea uh, and in Istanbul. And there's a change of discussion. But is it for real, in your uh, opinion, the industry waking up to that challenge? Well, there's no doubt that uh, the data, again, uh, that we look at today says that something really is changing and we're out of normal limits. Uh, and so actions need to be taken if we are to keep the temperature uh, change at any tolerable level. And that will require quite a lot of action quite quickly. I think we wasted a quarter century doing very little, really. So we've got to make up for lost time. Uh, the good news is during the uh, quarter century, I think we've developed quite a few engineering approaches and engineering processes that if we applied them all today, we could, we could reduce this problem hugely. They're too expensive to be uh, applied directly. But we don't need to innovate anything. We actually need to deploy technologies that we have today, and then we could begin to really cut this problem down to size. OK, let's see if we can drill down here and look at what the energy transition uh, really is about. How long is the transition uh, today of 85% of uh, primary energy is driven by hyd hydrocarbons? Uh, do you want to roll ahead 10 years? you know, 20 years, 30 years, and then look at that mix? So I hope every decade we'll see a, a measurable change. But remember, this transition is about changing the infrastructure of the world and changing the political economy of the world. So these are very big challenges. It's not as if they can be done immediately. This is not like updating your iPhone. This is hardware, very complicated, and it's about behavior and politics. So I think transitions are very long, and they may never, in the end, reach a final destination. 85% of the world's energy, which is uh, the largest uh, business in the world, is, is fossil fuel. That keeps changing. I, I, it hasn't changed recently, but the mix begins to change with people being worried about low-level pollution from coal. I think that's the thing that 
upsets people about coal, as well as CO2. Um, oil, I, I think, just is, is subject to technological displacement, as has happened since uh, the mid-'80s. It's clearly coming down as, as a percent, as, you know, a barrel of oil does, uh, produces more uh, GDP than it used to. Uh, and natural gas um, is, 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 is a growing activity and will continue to be there. But I, I think the change will be slow. Uh, and therefore, it says that the technologies you need to keep temperatures down are heavily related to the capture and storage or use of carbon. Okay, very good. So I want to suggest, if you follow the money, it's an indicator of what, what's going to be there in the future. Uh, L1 Energy has a partnership with the largest private producer uh, of, of oil in Europe, 800,000 barrels a day, which is... Uh, of oil equivalent, actually 70% natural gas. And 70% natural yes. gas. So you're, you're still investing in hydrocarbons. Oh, yes. I what's spent, your criteria for that? Uh, then? Provided that it's the lighter, the better, I would say. Uh, I spent, uh, after BP, I spent almost a decade running uh, the world's largest renewable energy fund. Uh, and I think that was a transition point where uh, renewable energy no longer was so dependent on state subsidy, but actually became uh, a, a competitive uh, uh, energy source, uh, one which could compete under the right conditions uh, with uh, energies from uh, oil and gas and from nuclear. Yeah, you singled out the gas, which is a fantastic point, because we talk about transition fuels and what natural gas can do to displace coal. Uh, and I want to ask another question about the lenders and what they should be doing with the coal plants that are you know, running full steam in some of the emerging markets today. How do you see the role of natural gas in the transition? Does it solve many of the problems that we've discussed earlier here? Well, it certainly solves some problems, not all problems it still needs, uh, someone has to clean up uh, the CO2 that's generated. But it's, it generates less CO2, which is good, uh, and as long as you can contain the uh, natural gas, it's methane, uh, and make sure it doesn't go up into the atmosphere, uh, that, and that is very possible and very profitable, uh, then it's a very good fuel. But if it, uh, if it leaks, it's not so good, because it's producing the same effect uh, as burning coal. So the ARENA Foundation here, or the organization, the International Renewable Energy Agency based here in Abu Dhabi, which is a statement in itself in the recognition of the transition, uh, in 2018, almost 50% of the money uh, invested was into the power sector, which includes, of course, some of the natural gas, and the other half in oil and gas, right? Uh, five years ago, the ratio was very different. All that money was going into oil and gas. So what do we see in terms of the trend for investment into the hydrocarbon sector vis-a-vis -vis the renewable sector, uh, which is going to eat up more of that power sector in the years to come? No doubt about it. So there, there's no doubt that investment will still take place in, in hydrocarbons. I think probably it's been excessive in the past. There's been a tremendous amount of wasted investment, certainly as the price of oil was tremendously high. I think people were investing as if there was no tomorrow, and it was not good for, for generally for investors, the people who own companies. But I think the balance will continue to shift, and it should be uh, shifted by lenders who should bias their approach to uh, uh, lending to lower carbon sources of energy. There's no doubt about that. Okay. I want to drill into the hydrocarbon sector here because we see uh, something historic. We cross 100 million barrels a day of daily demand. Uh, that demand is rising to about 1% a year. Uh, and the revolution in the last decade, as you know, has been the production coming out of the Permian Basin, uh, the Bakken field uh, in the United States. How long does that revolution last? And when will it be completely justified on the finances and the debt that's been run up by the lending on Wall Street. So uh, the Permian's been uh, quite a remarkable revolution. I remember working there before uh, it uh, a long time ago when it was much more conventional. But it, it is uh, an amazing change. 
uh, one which has grown enormously. I think the growth rate is unlikely to be maintained. Uh, and it's a, an area which was opened up by a tremendous number of very clever and very entrepreneurial smaller companies. Uh, they were fueled by a lot of debt and fueled by a continuous uh, possibility of going back to the equity markets too. That, that is changing. It's much more in the hands of bigger companies now. And it's part and parcel of the, what you might call the super major planning approach, which is there will be a certain amount of capital going in, not a penny more, and in the end, it has to produce cash flow. That wasn't the case with the smaller companies, as you can see with their stock market performance today and the fact that they're having to uh, change managements and change ways, or in some cases, simply be purchased by uh, larger companies. Uh, and so I think that that is undergoing a, a big change. I would expect, therefore, uh, that the rate of growth certainly needs to be moderated significantly. So we saw the U.S. cross 12 million barrels a day, which is above Russia and, and what Saudi Arabia is producing. Not that Saudi Arabia couldn't produce more, but there's an effort to, to balance the market. Uh, I've seen projections climbing to 17 million barrels a day, and then it tails back down again. Give us uh, some insight of what you're looking at. Who, who knows is the answer. I mean, I love these projections because the people who make them can never need to be accountable for them. Uh, and so uh, it's a, a wondrous thing, but, but I, I have no idea is the answer because there are plenty of things that will move positive and negatively uh, in, in the US. Stepping back, however, uh, I think the key point is that we have seen this uh, very clear correlation between uh, the amount of oil that goes into producing a unit of GDP from the mid-80s onwards. Uh, and it's a pretty, pretty clear thing that as time goes by, you need less oil. You need less oil. So it depends on the world growth. The more the world grows, the, the more oil you need. But, but I think we look at uh, industrial economies today, and uh, they certainly aren't growing as fast as they used to, and unlikely so to do in the future. So you know, you'd expect a limitation of demand uh, and there are plenty of sources of very low-cost oil in the world, notably from state producers, uh, that will be producing pretty well forever. Okay, so you, there'll be a balance here. You brought a number of things I need to follow up on then. When does peak demand for oil arrive? We're talking about expectations. Uh, if we're 100 million barrels, some suggest we'll get to 140 million barrels. Others at a tighter range that we've talked about, 105 to 115 million barrels a day. What's your, what's your bet on that? My guess at take, take the tighter range, I couldn't possibly predict one point. Uh, but I think there will be you know, a very long and slow uh, plateau, as it will, a small decline in, in demand, simply because of the change in the way we're dealing with economies. So do you, do you see a scenario where we go to, let's say, 115 million barrels a day, peak and then come down to where we are today because of the transition? It depends on too many things. It depends on the state of the world economy. It depends on competing sources. And it does depend on people's attitudes towards carbon dioxide. Uh, in this environment, because many people, that, because I live here in Abu Dhabi, they were saying, oh, in 15 years, that place is going to be a massive desert because there's not going to be demand for oil. If you maintain 100 million barrels a day, the low-cost producers of the world are the ones that do survive. It's a really overreaction to suggest that the Gulf states in particular and the other national producers you were talking about, or low-cost producers, won't survive this process. I, I, I think that's right. I mean, hydrocarbons will not be switched off. Uh, we can't do that. It is a gigantic, it is, after all, the motor power of civilization. I make the point that I think engineering is the basis upon which civilization is created, uh, and in order to fuel it, it is energy, and today 85% uh, fossil fuel energy. So it's up to us, I think, to fix the energy, to make sure it's low to no carbon, as, so we have to decarbonize the hydrocarbons. Mm. That's what we've got to do. The more that that can be done, the more appropriate the balance will be between renewables, nuclear, very important source, and, uh, and fossil fuels. Yeah, people talk about the geopolitics holding back the transition. 
How, how do you see that? Do you think that people will slow down the transition because you don't want instability in the Middle East or in other of these merging markets that uh, are big producers? It sounds to me too controlled. Uh, things are rather more random than that. Uh, I think no one controlled the Permian to change the way in which the United States uh, import of uh, energy changed. So, and I don't think people are going to do that again for the future. I think people are fairly wise and look at uh, the rate of transition. They don't panic. Uh, but equally, they, I, believe, I do believe they need to focus on making sure that we just don't inadvertently and, well, incorrectly, I think, uh, put too much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We've just got to figure out what to do with hydrocarbons. Good. This is a heated debate within the United States going into an election year in 2020. Uh, Elizabeth Warren has her ideas uh, about solutions. Is it a carbon tax that's inevitable and be much more aggressive uh, to start fostering that transition and fostering investments into renewables? So I had a remote dis uh, debate with uh, Senator Warren. Uh, there's one point I agree with her on, which is in order to get something done, you have to focus on the main event. Don't do displacement activity. So it's in, while it's quite important to have the right light bulbs, that doesn't solve the problem for you. You have to hit the question of what do you do with carbon dioxide. So to repeat your question, so... Uh, uh, does it mean a carbon tax in a much yes. more pervasive way? Uh, to, to my mind... I thought you were going to repeat my question for that's me. That's right. <laughs> no, 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 I just have to ask occasionally. I'm uh, here, don't worry. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, carbon tax is, is, is the key lever. There, there needs to be enough incentive for people to want to do something with CO2. So a carbon tax is, uh, in my view, the way to go. And I think Hank Polson put it correctly. Uh, you don't want to uh, create a situation that Mr. Macron had of a regressive, uh, a regressive tax which gets people on the street. You need a progressive one. So if you tax carbon, you should be considering how to redistribute that taxation to the population generally in a progressive way. Uh, that's really important. So it rebalances, if you will, the, the flow of money. It doesn't take it away and do something different with it. Uh, but that is very important. I think the debate on that in Washington was very lively and actually very productive. Let's see what happens. Uh, to my mind, none of this can happen <clears throat> until people visibly see some effect of climate change on their lives and begin to push their representatives, members of parliament, prime ministers to do something. But don't you think the human race is very slow in reacting to any real challenge. I've been, because of the program that I'm doing today and the people I talk to, they're very pessimistic about hitting the two degree target. Very alarmist. And so, most of the research that I'm reading is suggesting the same. The smoking cigarettes debate in the 1970s and 80s, are cigarettes bad for your health? It took us a long time to react to that. Right? But I, with the greatest respect, the, this human race is the only human race we have. We can't actually say, well, we'd like another one, which is very responsive. Uh, it is what it is. You know, the millennial uh, argument on this is that your generation, our generation, is very slow to react to the challenge, and you're leaving a mess for us. And shouldn't we wake up faster to that challenge? Well, my view is, yes, we should. But can we, we need to get everyone aligned to get this done. I mean, we can wring our hands and say, this is terrible. But what we need is planned programs and actions to get things done. Otherwise, you're right. We will have uh, temperature rises, most likely, uh, which will be intolerable for most of the human race. Uh, and the worst thing is that it will probably affect poor people far more deeply than it will the rich people in the world. So this is even worse in my mind. Displacement, then, is what we're talking about. So emergency investments is what we're suggesting here, too? Maybe adaptation. Uh, uh, if we don't do prevention, uh, reduction in CO2, then likely we'll have to do a very significant infrastructure adaptation, Good. as is seen by flooding and things like that. Good. You gave uh, a speech at your alma mater recently uh, at Stanford, 
and you publish a book, Make, Think, Imagine, Engineering the Future of Civilization. I want to tie these thoughts together. What are the, I read your speech to the, the students, but share with this audience here, uh, what are the words of wisdom uh, in light of what I was just talking about today? What was the motivation of the book? So the book is, the book is about uh, uh, creating uh, the future. It's about, I, I, I've always believed that civilization in the end is driven and made by engineering or it's a platform, and on top of that, we can do the great things of works of art, literature, and so forth, which I've been in, involved in myself. But it is actually engineering, and it's a very hopeful approach, because engineering produces intended consequences. Of course it does. So oil and gas, for example, produced a, a great change in the way in which the world developed. Uh, we're a richer, better, healthier world. Uh, we're a less violent world as a result of all the engineering. But once in a while, there are bad, unintended consequences. So no one sat back and said, let's burn hydrocarbons in order to heat up the world. Uh, so the unintended consequences are not, create, not helped by saying, let's do less engineering. You have to do more. So the unintended consequences are solved by even more mm. innovation and engineering and that's what we can do. And that's what I said to the people at Stanford Business School. I also said to them that there are no points to anyone doing something without actually being different. In the end, you have to be different, which is to step out of where you are today to say, we will make a change. Not making a change, presiding over the inevitable, is everything the millennials, I think, hate about a generation and I agree with them. Life is not about presiding over the inevitable. It's about being different. Good. In that spirit, I wasn't planning to ask you this, but how do you view the kind of radical nature of what we see in your home country of the UK and the Brexit crisis, but more so uh, the denial of climate change from Donald Trump? I mean, that can't be from the number one economy and the strongest uh, political power in the world still. Uh, a good thing for us in making the transition and dealing with the challenges that are facing us that we've been talking about. No, it's not a good thing, but uh, inevitably people will take different viewpoints. And I notice the United States has, is made of many states, and the states themselves are, are carrying on doing a variety of things. Which has been which pretty impressive about our constitutional important. system. Absolutely. So, uh, and, and, you know, there are, uh, and some of these things are real actions which I like. I, I'm not overly keen on the rhetoric. I'm more keen on seeing something happen. Hmm. But, but you, do you think there'll be a, a shift in the mentality with the states pushing back and the consumer pushing back to recognize the challenge yes, that's I, in front of us? I think so. And I think uh, you know, whether they are absolutely directly related to climate change, there may be. Uh, these extreme weather conditions that people see keeps reminding people that if, you know, if there's a probability that they're related, we should do something about this. This is not good to have you know, growing seasons change. I noticed that you know, grapes are picked earlier for wine. Uh, hurricane seasons are earlier. Temperatures are more extreme. The south of France, I think, had the highest temperatures ever recorded, 46 degrees centigrade. Uh, nothing here, but in France, very big, very big problem. Uh, they say uh, London's going to have the climate of Barcelona by 2050, so there's no reason to, to leave the UK for the weather, uh, if that's the reality. I think we'll need to install more air conditioning. That's the and reality. that's the problem. That is the problem. I was in India for the Global Energy Challenge, and the sales of air conditioners went up 18% in 2018, uh, to the point. They're getting wealthier, but the temperature is getting hotter. Yeah. One question, and I want to take some questions from the floor, if I can see uh, the microphones here, it would be great. Um, it feels like a pretty severe slowdown coming. We're nine, almost 10 years into the economic recovery after the global financial crisis. President uh, Trump has cut taxes. He's juiced the economy, tried to extend uh, the growth. Europe is slowing down. China is slowing down because of US-China trade war. Uh, even India is slowing down, just basically getting tired into the cycle. Does it feel like a recession is at our doorstep? And how, how does that play into uh, demand for energy? So uh, it, it certainly feels like we've come to the end of the big expansion period that we've had. And of course, the rates of growth are smaller than they used to be. People forget, if you look at 20, 30 years of growth rates, they've come right down. 
So small differences in the growth rates plunge us into little small recessions or not. Uh, I think we're going to be in a, in a low growth period for some time until something happens. And so that, that I think, is uh, something which also creates additional political stress in that there's less to go around. Good. You, you don't see a recession? or but You have oh. to invest money at this stage, so I don't want to talk us into a recession, but at the same time, I'm just trying to get a gauge of leading investors such as yourself. What are you planning for? So I'm certainly, <clears throat> I'm certainly planning for much lower growth. Um, recession, it's a, it, you can be technically in recession. It makes no odds too much. As an investor, you have to see through it. I don't invest on a quarterly trading basis. I tend to invest on uh, you know, half a decade, decade long investment. Uh, and I'm, my view is you invest thinking it's a lower growth, uh, uh, lower growth scenario. And, 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 and if you do that, then you're going to invest, I hope, reasonably well. Okay. Do we have some questions from the floor? And microphones here. Please, go ahead and stand up if you can, so he can see you. And there's another mic, uh, if the, another gentleman right there as well. Well, so let's start there, and then we'll hand it to you afterwards, sir. Go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Omar Minardian from National Grid US and the World Energy Council Future Energy Leaders Program. Um, I was curious to hear your view on offshore wind, um, particularly in relation to some of BP's competitors entering the US market. Um, is there any substance to that? Is it a case of greenwashing? Um, and is it something you explored while you were there? Great. Thanks. Thanks. You can hand the microphone to the gentleman next to you. It would be great. Uh, offshore wind, which is running around 12 and a half cents globally, yeah. right? Per so, kilowatt hour. Uh, first, I think, uh, you know, wind power in the right place. I'm still a member of the board of a company that I helped found, Patton Energy, Ruhin, Peggy, uh, in the U.S. We're big investors in primarily wind or all over the world, but it ma it's a matter of picking your locations. They're genuinely good businesses, uh, and I think investors with the right balance sheet, it takes a good balance sheet to do this, should continue to invest. Some offshore wind works, some of it doesn't. Uh, I see the most extreme offshore wind is floating offshore wind in Norway, very expensive, will require significant state subsidies uh, until it gets to be competitive. But it's all over the place. My view is it's a very valid place to invest so long as the costs are fine. Mm, uh, greenwashing by PP. Uh, it, it's been investing quite aggressively in the renewable space. No, I, I, de I, I, I tend to be, uh, I would naturally say I tend to be more generous in my thinking. Uh, I think that there are some very big oil and gas companies that are trying to experiment in what they can do for the future, whether it is a venture investing in new energies, whether it's a renewable energy, uh, whether it's um, uh, non-hydrocarbon-based non liquid fuels. Th these, I think, are all valid. Uh, it remains to be seen whether these things go from interesting activities to large investment propositions, uh, and none of them have reached that stage yet. So let's wait and see. Good question here. Very quickly, please, yes. if you can. I'm Sandro Clerici from Italy. Just 2018, plus 29% of increase in primary energy consumption, according to the BP report. Just two-thirds of the CO2 emissions are in non-OECD countries, one-third in that. Non-OECD countries, last 10 years, plus 3.4% increase. OECD country negative. What do you think? This will imply a new strategic approach, to go back to CDM approach or something like that. Because if we invest, European Union less than 9% of that with a strong decrease, and it's costing 100 of euro per ton of CO2 avoided, while it will cost by far less in developing country and city country. What strategic approach you believe will be successful? Well, uh, as you know, uh, I've, I always thought the CDM approach was a pretty good, except for the fact that it became bogged down in a gigantic bureaucracy and its purpose uh, got altered. People didn't trust it. And there was also a slight political, uh, an overlay that this was a, 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 almost an approach to colonization, which was not appropriate. 
But I do think that uh, if we can find a mechanism of investing in the lowest cost uh, CO2 reductions rather than the highest cost, the better. But I don't think we will completely do that uh, unless we can do it through global financing. Uh, a, a little bit of that will help. But in the end, I'm afraid we're going to have to find different ways of people doing what they believe is right in their countries. I don't see any mechanism for world government here. Uh, on that point, my last question, uh, shouldn't we rethink lending, though? Because in my visit to India, I was surprised about the lack of the latest technologies with the coal plants, for example. The Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank or the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, should we just rethink entirely how we support these emerging markets in the energy transition with a sense of urgency? I, I, I do believe we should. Uh, and we've tried, uh, uh, there have be, there've been phases where people have been doing that. I think we must make sure, though, it doesn't get so rigidly bureaucratic that inadvertently we starve a nation of the energy they need. That's inappropriate. Because the energy wrong. poverty is pretty radical. Precisely. So it, it is. So if it's done in the right way, I think then this is what we should do. We should be leaning ever backwards to finance low, low carbon sources against high carbon sources. But there's that argument, you know, we deserve to have our energy, which nobody can argue with because they've been living without it. Even in the case of India, you see it uh, in Africa and Latin America as, at the same time. But shouldn't we not insist, but shouldn't we support the transition away from coal, for example, at a much more radical pace? Of, of course, and I think that's what I was saying. Uh, I think it is very important, uh, but uh, every time I talk about this, uh, former Prime Minister Singh's words ring in my ears. Uh, he reminded me that uh, every human has an equal a right to an equal share of the, of the atmosphere. Mm. Uh, and we should just remember that. Uh, especially as an American, who we've eaten up about a third of it, right? I think that's the final point. I think people would love to hear from you. The BP of today, uh, when you made that speech in 1997, they had the Gulf crisis uh, in, in the United States. Uh, Tony Hayward didn't manage that transition. You have a new leadership in place that's divesting its portfolio. How would you rate your former company where it is today and where you thought it would be when you made that speech? So, so the good thing is I'm not a shareholder. I don't hold shares in oil and gas companies. Uh, I, I think it's doing very well. I think it's been brought through a, a tragedy, which is the uh, Gulf of Mexico spill, and it's uh, reset itself very well. And I like to think that uh, what's going on in the in the work they're doing on venture and uh, the, the uh, ca carbon light, carbon free activity is a good thing and it could lead to something important for the future. So looking good so far, I would say. But you know, the thing about uh, any company is uh, the dangerous thing is to be satisfied. The dangerous thing is to be satisfied, you can't get complacent. Never. It sounds like Andy Grove who applied that to Intel, but you're doing it to he oil. He was my great mentor. Oh, that's and, interesting. Uh, I, I was on the board with him for a decade. But uh, no, there's no such thing. You should never, ever be satisfied, ever, when it comes to running a company. Great. It's nice to see you. Let's give a warm uh, thanks to Lord Brown, the former ch chief executive of BP and the chairman of uh, L1 Energy. It's good Thank to you. see you.